Hello and welcome to Your Health Reclaim. I'm your host, Dr. PND. This is going to be our second podcast in the making, and I'm really excited. And today we are actually going to talk about a very common um, scenario, uh, issue that is very, very, very prevalent among women in reproductive um, age, and that is uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or short PCOS. Um, I'm very, very certain a lot of you guys have heard that expression and those, uh, you know, uh, names of, uh, you know, this particular ailment. It is very prevalent and very common um, among women, again, and it is something that unfortunately is um, either misdiagnosed, sometimes overdiagnosed, and more often than not, it has really failed um, the conventional pattern of treatment. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about uh, briefly what it is. Um, I'm not going to go into statistics and any you know uh, details regarding that, but I just want to go over what it is and ultimately what is the driving factor or factors behind uh, that ailment and what can be done to naturally and effectively address that uh, long term. Okay, so uh, we're not going to be going over treatment uh, or any kind of uh, you know symptom management but I would like to talk to you um, and give you practical ways that you'll be able to apply to begin to <clears throat> uh, either prevent that, which is a lot easier, or uh, address the root cause of the problem uh, just you know, for long-term success. So uh, PCOS is a common but complex endocrine disorder that obviously affects women of reproductive age. Um, it ties into multiple bodily systems, uh, including the ovaries, adrenal glands, uh, the thyroid in certain stances, uh, the GI, gastrointestinal system, and also the brain. Um, usually, uh, doctors rely on three main uh, criteria to diagnose PCOS. Uh, one of them is uh, infrequent ovulation or inovulation, also known in, as uh, ovulatory dysfunction. Make sure I said that right. Uh, elevated androgen levels, as indicated by blood tests, also known as hyperandrogenism. And number three, uh, cysts on ovaries is indicated by a transvaginal ultrasound, also known as polycystic ovarian morphology. Um, and usually a woman must fulfill at least two of the three criteria to be considered um, you know, a successive diagnosis of PCOS. Now, the most common of, of uh, symptoms of PCOS are going to be irregular or missing periods, abnormal hair growth, especially in the face, male pattern, hair loss, uh, and baldness, uh, acne, infertility, um, irregular blood sugar issues, um, weight gain, or weight loss resistance. Okay, so these are the most common. There's obviously other ones, you know, particularly when it comes to mood and you know, depressive and mood episodes and so forth. Now, women may be present with a complete conventional PCOS symptom picture or with just a few of these, but importantly, um, you know, we're coming to understand that PCOS occurs on a spectrum and that the three main criteria used to diagnose PCOS may not apply honestly to all women uh, with PCOS-like uh, clinical picture. So with that, I wanted to go over and you know, address the underlying mechanisms um, that, you know, are usually the driving force behind uh, PCOS. So to understand how nutrition can improve PCOS, it helps to first understand some of the underlying causes and mechanisms driving this particular condition. <clears throat> PCOS tends to be characterized by seven key features. Gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, global chronic inflammation in the body, uh, imbalances of the hormones, um, often uh, you know, high stress, chronic stress, persistent stress uh, in life, um, and obviously environmental toxins exposure, which you know, our environment is prevalent with. Um, another thing is insulin resistance, which is one of the big factors I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and also, believe it or not, overtraining. Yes, overtraining as in doing too much physical activity. Um, we're seeing this actually a lot with, you know, a lot of uh, crossfit athletes, um, also a lot of the female bodybuilders, like competitive bodybuilders, you see that. And that is a big problem. Uh, obviously, exercise can be something that is extremely uh, helpful, very beneficial, healthy long term. But like anything else, it can be overdone. And in this particular case, we're talking about ECOS, overtraining can definitely uh, exacerbate uh, symptomology greatly and make the condition worse. Okay. 
So first and foremost, I want to say this, that each one of these mechanisms that I just described can be addressed at least in part by successful uh, custom tailored uh, by individual respected uh, nutritional innovation. So let's discuss each one of these mechanisms in turn, and then we can dive into the discussion of how you know, nutrition along with other modalities uh, can help. So insulin resistance, as I mentioned, uh, that is assumed to be probably the most important and the primary driver behind um, PCOS. So insulin resistance is a condition in which the cells in the muscle, fat, and liver do not respond appropriately uh, and eventually at all uh, to the hormone insulin. Insulin shutters glucose from the blood into the cells, allowing it to be utilized for energy production. So when the cells become not responsive to insulin, um, glucose lingers in the blood, uh, causing obviously hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, and from there, you know, inflammation and all sorts of myriad of uh, you know health effects that a lot of you guys know already. Uh, so it's estimated that well over 60% of women with PCOS present have some kind of varying degree of insulin resistance. Um, it is assumed, uh, and I honestly tend to agree with that, that insulin resistance is actually a lot higher percentage that, you know, assume 50-60%. But just assume even if you just this 50, 60%, that, that's, a, that's a great amount of number uh, for that to happen. So uh, insulin resistance obviously can occur in overweight uh, people, but also includes uh, people that are underweight, lean people, uh, and very normal weight. Uh, so it, the really insulin resistance is no discriminatory based on actually weight. And I mean, when I say weight, I mean body fat, you know, people that are morbidly obese or not. Um, you know, I see that across all boards, young, old, uh, you know, male, female, uh, you know, morbidly obese, slightly overweight, normal weight, underweight, you know, weight to lean, uh, including people that are actually very athletic and people that are extremely active and generally healthy. So correcting insulin resistance is absolutely the essential first step for us to be able to address that. So before anything else, insulin resistance has got to be correct again. Um, there's obviously uh, the, you know, conventional models goals uh, uses a lot of insulin sensitizing drugs, you know, uh, for the use for type 2 diabetes, especially metformin and such. But it, that has really not proven useful at all. It might mitigate the symptoms and temporary relief it might be seen, but in the long run does not run, um, does not work well at all. So the root cause of the problem has to be addressed without fail. And that is going to be, again, lifestyle and nutrition. <coughs> So uh, just a quick note, I, I want to make it very abundantly clear that not all uh, women with PCOS will have insulin resistance, but the great majority of it will to some extent, and most of them, like I said, 50, 60% of them will have a quite, quite substantial have that issue, okay? So just keep that in mind. The next thing I want to talk about is extremely important, and that also has to be addressed, um, is going to be gastrointestinal dysfunction. Okay. We have a tremendous amount of growing body of evidence uh, and research now that, you know, the, the microbiota, uh, the healthy bugs in the human uh, gut uh, play extremely important role in PCOS and the influencing key factors of uh, the syndrome, including, you know, insulin resistance, hyperandrogenism, which is, you know, high androgen levels uh, and chronic global inflammation. So one thing is the disrupted intestinal, uh, you know, flora. Uh, when you have this biosis, uh, we, without fail, uh, can it will affect, um, you know, the condition uh, and or be part of, you know, the causative factor. So the gut dysfunction is going to be huge. And that's something that we really, really have to address uh, without uh, fail. The third thing is the, what I call global chronic inflammation. Global meaning that your whole body is inflamed. These inflammatory markers your whole body, it just your whole body is basically on the chronic state of inflammation. And when you have chronic inflammation, which is a massive part of that, is or if not the whole part of it, is going to be due to our lifestyle and nutrition and the you know the poor foods that we eat, the highly refined processed foods that we consume. But um, basically, chronic inflammation is going to ultimately impair insulin sensitivity, cause you know insulin resistance. Um, you know blood sugar dysregulation is going to disrupt the gut microbiome, is going to impair some way, shape, or form the HPTA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, um, ultimately disrupting hormonal balance. 
Okay, so anyway, swing it, that, that is going to happen with chronic inflammation. Now, obviously damaging many other things, but since we're talking about PCOS here specifically, these things are going to be, you know, at hand with uh, chronic inflammation. When you have also chronic inflammation, you know, again, it's going to lead to hormonal imbalances. And when that happens, a lot of things um, begin to break down, down the chain of command. Okay, so I'm not going to go, you know, much into it, but everybody knows a, a big, you know, aspect of PCOS is, you know, the overproduction of androgens. So those excess androgen called estrogen, you know, uh, and estrogen dominance uh, cause a lot of problems. Uh, you know, anyway, for more retention, weight gain, mood issues, uh, you know, contributing to other, uh, you know, again, breakage of the chain of command down the road. Uh, so, you know, balancing the hormones is extremely important in, uh, you know, addressing that. Um, next is going to be the chronic stress, really. The chronic stress can be both a trigger of the onset and also uh, a factor that will, without fail, severely exacerbate the existing uh, PCOS uh, symptomology. Okay, so we don't have to talk about stress. Everybody knows the stress kills is deadly. You know, if you look at the statistics, you'll see the emergency room visits uh, from non-traumatic uh, injuries and issues. A lot of them are caused to psychological stress, just stress in general. You know, people think they have a heart attack, they can't breathe, you know, migraines, headaches, you name it. So, uh, again, addressing the stress. Chronic stress is addressed, aside from the physical aspects like overtraining, it's going to be a psychological aspect to that, right? That is really, you know, addressing, you know, faulty belief patterns, uh, faulty preconceived notions in life. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, PTSD uh, from childhood, from current uh, experiences and so forth, financial issues, marital issues, relational issues with families, all those things come together very hard, um, you know, to play a uh, factor in the stress. Um, so the next one is going to be exposure to environmental toxins. Now, everybody knows about BPA, by skin away, everybody knows about phthalates and PFOAs and uh, you know, heavy metals and other toxic elements. Uh, it's very prevalent in our environment. I mean, from the time we get up in the morning and start, you know, brushing our teeth and washing our face all the way to the time we go to bed, the average American gets exposed to a tremendous amount of chemicals. Uh, then many of them have been proven to be endocrine disruptors. Many of, uh, many of them have been known to cause cancer, suspected of, uh, uh, you know, causing cancer such as uh, you know, uh, carcinogenic, have carcinogenic effects. Uh, many of them have, you know, other toxicity issues that are not even known. Uh, but the bottom line is environmental uh, health is very important. And when you have all those chemicals in our system, it, it really makes a, it makes a massive difference uh, in the toxic burden and ultimately the stress of our body. So that also has to be addressed. Um, and the last thing we talked about is uh, <clears throat> the overtraining aspect. Now, some people don't have a problem with that. You know, people don't work out or they, you know, they work out moderately and they actually do a good job. And to them, that type of training is, uh, is a positive factor. But uh, younger population, uh, you know, people in the teens and 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, again, especially with, you know, very high intensity, uh, high frequency training protocols, whether it be uh, ultra endurance sports like marathon training, you know, CrossFit, um, it can have a lot of, um, negative effect on, on overtraining in the system. So it's not just they're not under recovering, but they're just going past their lines. And me being in the strength and conditioning field for so many you know years and you know doing personal training and being to fitness in the fitness world in general and being a competitive athlete myself, I can firsthand vouch how overtraining can really wreak a havoc on the endocrine system by default. Uh, so you know central nervous system, just everything gets affected. And it's not easy, I'm sorry, it's not hard at all to overtrain, especially if you have somebody pushing you. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things you know, uh, that I see is people doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. Um, the question we always ask or used to ask is, is not what a person can do physically, is what is it that they can recover properly from? So somebody able to you know crush their workout and do you know for example get CrossFit five days a week you know hour at a time, and, but if you're not recovering properly, you're causing that systemic stress that again is going to start breaking things down the chain of command and really affect the physiology of the body. So you know really consider that. I know to 
a lot of people exercise is an addiction uh, and they can justify that is a healthy addiction, granted. Right? But nonetheless, there's no such thing as a healthy addiction. Anything good in of itself can be taken uh, to severity uh, and become a negative. So just keep that in mind. All right, so let's go ahead and go into um, the interventions uh, and how we can ease and improve uh, the symptoms. So the first, first and foremost, okay, and you guys are gonna hear me talk about this a lot, is what I introduce um, the staple or the causative factors of um, any disease that is non-acute um, and non-trauma, physical trauma-based. So when you have a disease, right, you're going to know that by having symptoms. And a symptom is going to be an expression of a dysfunction of the body. A dysfunction is a sign of two things which almost always nowadays are going to be present together. And those two things are going to be nutritional deficiencies and some form of toxicity. So let me go over this again. In a nutshell, any chronic disease, regardless of what it is, that is non-acute, non-traumatic based, that is going to be the cause of combination of nutritional deficiencies along with some kind of toxicity. So for instance, let's talk about migraine. A lot of people suffer with migraines. I cannot tell you how many people, for instance, are deficient in basic mineral composition and basic vitamin requirements of the body, such as magnesium and B complexes. And almost always you see an improvement to degree. That's the deficiency. Another thing is the, uh, aside from the deficiency is the toxicity, is a lot of people have food sensitivities, not food allergies, but food sensitivities. So a lot of times when I deal with migraines, believe it or not, not always, but a lot of times it can be a sim simple fact of literally doing a very comprehensive uh, IgG food uh, testing that looks for the food sensitivities that a person can have, and almost always they do. Then removing those triggering foods and triggering inflammation, and at the same time, optimizing their micronutritional intake, micro meaning, meaning like vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, polyphenols, and other stuff. Basically put them on a very high, good high density uh, nutrient uh, diet that also is uh, heavily supplemented with high quality supplements. Uh, for instance, B complexes and magnesium and the right form of magnesium done the right way, the right dosing for the person you have no idea how many times it those two little simple things will address the migraines completely and permanently. So without going off on a tangent too much, <laughs> the key of healing from any chronic disease is addressing the nutritional deficiencies and addressing the toxicities, okay? So let's go back and uh, relate this to PCOS, what we're talking about today. So the first thing is to address the nutritional deficiencies. And that is always going to be done first and foremost with the absolute foundational staple basis that we thought and nothing else is gonna change is going to be proper dietary intervention. What's proper? It all depends on the person. People always ask, do you believe in keto and paleo or carnivore, or vegan, or vegetarian, plant-based, whatever. I, I, I don't. Um, every person has not by individual need um, genealogy and their ancestry has to be respected um, you know their lifestyle has to be respected their taste has to be respected again you do specialty testing to be able to see who works who doesn't um, I can tell you this that I've never had experience putting somebody on an extreme diet and having really good success long term um, and I've tried them all believe me uh, but you know I, I literally have tried them all so a proper diet, you know, and that is going to be a very high nutrient dense nutritional protocol that's going to be directed towards that person's individual needs. Ultimately, it's going to be an anti-inflammatory, again, highly nutrient dense diet of some form. It's going to be balanced without fail. So you're going to have good, a lot of fiber, you know, a lot of good, healthy, you know, high quality, highly absorbable protein, good, healthy, stable easily digestible starches and healthy 
nutritious fats. Uh, so when you combine in a meal, protein, starch, fiber, and fat, you're tremendously decreasing the glycemic load of that meal. So not only are we not using, for instance, processed foods, which obviously everybody knows are very high glycemic, they can raise blood sugar very fast. So not only are we using wholesome, good quality, high nutrient dense foods, but when you combine different foods that have with you know, different macronutrients in them, the proteins, the fats, and the carbs, the whole sum of the meal has a load and that's called the glycemic load of the meal. So when you combine the proper foods, that glycemic load drops drastically, therefore causing what? Phenomenal, healthy, stable blood sugar response. Okay? So that is the first and most important way to begin to improve insulin resistance, as we talked about, blood sugar dysregulation, right? So, you know, anti-inflammatory, high nutrient dense diet, that is going to be the absolute foundational basis staple. If you don't address that, nothing happens. People always ask, can I take supplements? Can I mix and match? No, you can't. There's not a supplement on the market. There's not a drug on the market or any combination of the above that you know, is going to you know, address any issue. Nutrition is the absolute most powerful weapon that we have of choice to any chronic disease, hands down. And I'll argue against that to anybody, anytime and anywhere. Okay. You don't address nutrition, nothing happens. I always ask the question, is the 80-20 rule good? No, it's not. Whoever put that rule down, they've never done anything 100% themselves. I promise you that. So that is absolutely ridiculous and some quite right down stupidity because you cannot, you know, the, the more serious the issue is, the more gung ho you have to be with your nutrition. So 100% or close to it is the name of the game with nutrition, all right? So <laughs> you guys can see I'm very passionate about that, but that is the brutal reality. Always go back to the episode uh, number one that I did, and that is that I'll tell you the truth, I'll tell you my experience, and I'll not compromise on the truth in any way, shape or form. Do I know everything? No, I never will, but I tell you what I know has worked, and there are many, 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 many successful people that have lived and are still living now to treat chronic conditions and they can vouch for the same thing. You don't address the nutrition, nothing much is going to change. Uh, all right, so another aspect um, that we're gonna go, which is kind of rise from the first one is um, from the diet and the anti-inflammatory diet is really using healing foods. So every food or type of food is going to have some kind of chemical composition that is going to differ, all right? For example, let's take protein. Well, you might have four ounces of, you know, wild caught Alaskan sockeye salmon, and you might have four ounces of truly organic, truly pasture raised, high quality beef or bison. Okay, have four ounces, four ounces. Generally speaking, they're all going to contain the same amount of protein, around 22, 24 grams, depending on the fat composition, obviously. But you're going to have the same. However, the composition of the salmon, even though it's going to provide you similar calories, pretty much similar to the same amount of protein, the chemical composition of the micronutrients is going to be different than the beef. And so when you're using healing foods, you have to respect the chemical, uh, biochemical composition of each food and what it has. Obviously, everybody knows salmon has a very high omega content, has astaxanthin, that's what gives it that reddish orange bright color that is really awesome healthy actually exempt is one of the strongest natural antioxidants for instance that people you know can eat uh which has different you know uh, grass-fed beef uh, has other phenomenal properties it also has omegas and other things but here's slightly different healing composition parts um we can go different way to organs obviously you know kidney heart liver all those foods have very very high nutrient dense aspects to them that you know, can really have very, very you know, helping and healing properties to them. Uh, obviously, we can go to, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, and, you know, starches. Um, I like to use, you know, you know whoever, you know, can uh, with my, and my clients. I love using organic uh, yams and sweet potatoes. Um, and there's at least 10 varieties that I am able to obtain here, you know, in, when I live in the Atlantic area. Uh, and they have tremendous amount of nutrition at different ones. If you look at the coloring of them, they'll have different antioxidant composition, different polyphenols and so forth. So um, incorporating, you know, the healing 
aspects of foods uh, is very important here, okay? For particularly for uh, PCOS, and that is if you're not sensitive to those foods, because again, you might be sensitive, but things like you know, organic pumpkin seeds, cashew, almonds, bananas, dark leafy greens, dandelion greens is phenomenal. That's a great detoxifier. It has, uh, has a bitter, it's, it tastes bitter actually when you chew on the dandelion like green leaf that you can get. Um, it's a very uh, stimulating to the bile, very uh, cleansing to the liver, uh, and just great for oral digestion, a great source of prebiotic fiber. A lot of people don't eat it because it has a bitter taste to it, but you can put it in your salad, right? It has a tremendous amount of magnesium, uh, all the stuff that I mentioned. Uh, inositol. Inositol is extremely important because that helps with mitigate insulin uh, resistance and response, and also lower blood sugar. So inositol is a, basically is a B vitamin like compound compound that does improve insulin signal, especially in uh, PCOS. Uh, the uh, isomer of my inositol is the preferred form of inositol for women. Uh, you can also take that as a supplement uh, that you know I use and have. Some people can eat stuff from heck, can obtain the foods. It's a very effectively dose supplement uh, in that respect. But things like cantaloupe, oats, citrus fruits, nuts, again, organic, you know, highly you know nutritious. Uh, are very, very uh, helpful in those healing foods. Zinc, extremely important, again, from numerous levels, but ultimately zinc insufficiency plays a massive role in metabolic dysfunction and dysregulation, uh, particularly when it comes to the immune system. So things like, you know, again, grass-fed beef and bison, you know, poultry, oysters, other shellfish, um, certain nuts like pumpkin seeds, has a lot of zinc in it. So on and on it goes, uh, but I don't want to waste too much time. But remember, foods have healing effect. Okay, foods have healing effect. Uh, you know, cruciferous vegetables, they're phenomenal for estrogen regulation and metabolism and detoxification and clearance. Like people hear the bad estrogens, the good estrogens, uh, they do, you know, and a lot of people, you know, do really well, as long as, you know, sense that those, if you are, then you have to use a supplemental form of that. So just think about the healing um, you know, effect of food. Always think about that. Now, a lot of people um, always ask about the ketogenic diet. If the ketogenic diet, when it comes to reversal of diabetes, um, obviously improving insulin sensitivity and addressing insulin resistance, it does, it initial, initially does a great job. Uh, and it does actually very fast. My experience has been, that you can implement a short term. Not everybody does well on it, especially in long term. But if it's a pressing issue, the ketogenic diet can be applied immediately for a few weeks at a time. And then depends how the person does, you can switch over to a more balanced diet. But regardless of what, you're still going to have a low glycemic load and low glycemic index food, which in the long run, that's what it matters. Uh, but yes, ketogenic diet uh, really can make a big difference. Uh, so one of the things also about PCOS is disorder eating behaviors. That is huge. That's very important because a lot of people have eating uh, disorders. And honestly, it doesn't have to be bulimia or you know, anorex anorexia, uh, but it could be just too many calorie counting. Again, over-exercising, over-training, under-eating. That really, really stimulates the metabolism in a, in a bad way eventually. So sufficient caloric intake is extremely important. It is extremely important. And again, balancing the macronutrients, protein, carbs, and fats. Um, let's see. So the next one is going to be uh, something that a lot of people <laughs> freak out about. And that is correcting insufficient carbohydrate intake. And when I say carbohydrate, I'm not talking about fiber. Fiber obviously is very important, but fiber has no caloric value, okay? Um, it's extremely important for gut health, especially and many other things, but it does not have caloric intake. So what I'm talking about is healthy carbohydrate starches. And what I like to call is mild and healthy starches. Most often than not, these are going to include honestly, elimination of grains and the inclusion of, of a lot of tubers, things like potatoes, yams, sweet potatoes, yuca, root. Uh, they're extremely, extremely beneficial. One, they're very low glycemic. Number two, they have a tremendous amount of prebiotic fiber that is very healthy and very nourishing to your healthy gut bacteria. 
and a lot of people do really well, um, especially if people have sensitivity to grains, which a lot of people do. And yes, that includes, unfortunately, oatmeal. Now, oatmeal kind of is in between. So as long as you're getting certified organic, um, especially like the sprouted oats, um, and with their you know glyphosate tested, basically the Roundup free and you know truly organic, uh, a lot of people do well with them as well. Uh, but generally speaking, I like to take grains out temporarily and really focus on those healthy starches and carbohydrates. Uh, so eat enough carbohydrates. People are so afraid of carbohydrates, but I cannot tell you how many people have done a great damage to their metabolism, especially their thyroid, when they completely cut out healthy starches. And remember what I said before, foods have chemistry. You're not gonna equate, say 100 grams of starch or carbohydrate from processed, I don't know, white bread, which is you know, pretty much worthless, to 100 you know, grams of starch coming from organic Japanese yam or jewel yam. Completely two different things than the composition behind that. Uh, so keep that in mind. And if you're eating good, healthy, healthy, truly healthy starches, it's very hard to overeat to begin with. And no, you're not going to gain anything with that. I can guarantee you. If anything, people that have that overtrain a lot or have a lot of stress, have too many low calories, you know, when you start to actually up their healthy carbohydrate intake throughout the day, especially at night. It's amazing how healing uh, of an effect they have, and uh, you'll be able to recalibrate the metabolism very actually efficiently. So just keep that in mind. I know a lot of you guys are carbophobic, <laughs> but just keep that in mind. So the other thing I want to talk about is optimizing protein intake. I know like this is a big word, and obviously they have a lot of people in the medical community, you know, even you know, in the vegan and plant-based community that you know you can overdo the protein so much and is being overdone. You know, the reality is actually protein is really not overdone. And believe it or not, a lot of times it's underdone, especially when it comes to women and especially older women. And in general, the older population, like you know, people 60s plus and above, they have a harder time getting high quality and enough protein in the diet to begin with. So protein is extremely important on numerous levels, which I'm not going to go into here, but you really need to optimize your protein levels. A general rule of thumb is you want to get to about 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per lean body mass. So say you weigh 220 pounds and your lean body mass is 180 pounds, right? Then you want to meet close to 150, 180 grams protein per day. Uh, and that's not as easy to do as people think it is, especially if you weight train, especially if you exercise a lot. So that's very important. You know, very, very important to be able to meet that protein intake. <laughs> Another thing for, uh, that we're going to go into is get off of dairy. Um, aside from ghee, uh, grass-fed organic ghee or grass-fed organic butter, I'll really get off of dairy because dairy um, products naturally contain uh, hormone and hormone-like molecules in them, uh, especially insulin-like growth factors called IGF-1. And these uh, IGF-1 signal is very heavily implicated in ovarian, uh, you know, hyper, um, what do you call it, uh, androgenism, basically causes high androgen response and production. Uh, and you can look it up on PubMed and NCBI, uh, it's, you know, it's there. So getting off dairy is a must. Anybody that I work with PCOS, insulin resistance, they're going to have to get off the eye. So notice I just said PCOS and also insulin resistance. So I have somebody, male or female, that doesn't have PCOS, um, but they do have insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes or they're pre-diabetic. Dairy has to go without fail, yeah, for, at, least, at least for the time being until everything is normalized or recalibrated and brought back to normal and the person you know, goes back to normal and optimal health. Uh, but dairy has to go. So that is very, very... Um, you know, important. Uh, the last thing that I want to, you know, really discuss thoroughly is the limiting of toxins from your environment. The biggest source of toxins for most people are going to be water, uh, without fail. That's the water you drink. Uh, most people drink from plastics, so you're going to have plasticides such as like you know, BPA and there's other BPs. BP stands for bisphenol, as a you know chemical chemistry name. Uh, 
um, you know, the molecules of you know different families. You can have you know bisphenol A, bisphenol B, bisphenol C. Either way, you have plastic leaching from that water. So you got to stop drinking out of plastic. A lot of the stainless steel products, believe it or not, contrary to popular belief, like the canteens and so forth, they're lined with a very thin form of plastic. So it doesn't roll the steel or whatever it might be. So that's not a good either. So glass is really the only you know, acceptable option. Number two, you really want to get a proper filtration system for your house and or at least you know go to the reverse osmosis machines and get that high quality water. Uh, reverse osmosis water is going to be hands down the cleanest and uh, most applicable water that removes pretty much everything, uh, all you know, chemicals, including fluoride, which is extremely damaging. People uh, have those breeder filters or just basic sedimentation filter. Uh, they're pretty much worthless. Even if it takes out the odor of chlorine or chloramines that are in the water, there is so many different chemicals that are in there, particularly fluoride, that is extremely damaging to the metabolism, to the thyroid, to the pituitary gland, and so forth. Fluoride is a poison, okay? Fluoride is, is a poison, and you guys can go to fluorideactionnetwork.com and you can learn all you want. It, but it's, you know, it's not good. It has to be taken out. So reverse osmosis water is really what you should be eating and drinking and cooking with, okay? Another uh, massive source of uh, toxicity is our food supply. So if you don't buy organic, by default, you're going to be risking getting a lot of different residues of you know, agriculture, chemicalized agriculture, whether it be herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, uh, you know, hormone residues, residues from antibiotic use, you know, genetically modified crops. And there's a lot of toxicity in there. So you definitely, without a you know, fail, want to be able to use organic or truly naturally certified uh, food, whether they be you know, animal products or you know, vegetables, fruits, and so forth. Uh, there's EWG, Environmental Working Group. You can go to EWG.com and you can literally see what uh, foods and so forth uh, are, you know, contain what kind of chemicals, what kind of, you know, uh, agricultural chemicals and so forth. There's also a thing called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen, which you might have heard of. You know, that's also very useful a lot of times if you don't have any ass, uh, access to, um, you know, organic food. At least you can make better choices. So <clears throat> the third um, massive exposure, especially for women, is going to be hygiene products. Things like shampoo, conditioners, lotions, soaps. Um, you know, feminine uh, products, you know, like tampons and pads, uh, you know, toilet paper as well. Um, these are very, very uh, heavily laden uh, products with numerous of chemicals. Uh, they really do cause problems because anytime it goes in the body, your skin, your eyes, your mouth, it doesn't matter. It is going to get inside and it's going to cause problem. And it's not the one time or two times or one product that you might be using. It's always a cumulative response from over the years using many different things each and every day okay it's all cumulative so always remember that that's you know, that's a big big problem um switch your you know makeup switch your you know deodorant that's a huge source of you know toxicity um which obviously a lot of people know that you know uh certain chemicals in the deodorants you know, especially you know, aluminum hydrochloride and so forth causes problems. You know, it's linked to breast cancer and so forth. So use your mind and really, you know, switch those things up. Uh, the Environmental Working Group, again, they have, you know, a lot of um, different uh, options. They have a ebook called, I believe, uh, Skin Deep, or they have actually a database now, it's called Skin Deep, uh, that, you know, is for makeup and personal hygiene products and so forth. But you can look it up and you really can start being selective and buying and using non-toxic products, okay? So toxicity has to be addressed because, again, a lot of those hormones, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of those chemicals disrupt hormones. Uh, some, of, some are carcinogenic, uh, some are endocrine uh, disruptors, excuse me, some are both. Uh, and you can go to Mingo, the CDC website. You can go to World Health Organization, National Institute of Health. Uh, you can look those chemicals up. It's right on there. They'll tell you what it is. You know, the, the ones that have been tested, they'll say endocrine disruptors or they'll say, you know, potential or known human carcinogens and so forth. So just, you know, be smart and you know, be wise. Here's the bottom line. When it comes to PCOS, 
like any other Crohn's disease, it can be reversed. Okay. It's a lot easier to prevent, a lot easier to prevent, but it can be reversed. But you got to change your ways. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to change your nutrition. You have to change a lot of things. The 20 year old, really, the 90 10 year old doesn't work either. Okay. Um, and you just have to be disciplined. You have to be diligent. Uh, and you have to have a strong will. And people always ask me, you know, what is the formula for success? What, are the, what is the difference between those people that succeed and those people that don't? And I always tell them the difference is these people are diligent. They have a strong will. They make it happen. They make choices. They set their mind to it and they go after it. Do they do it perfectly? Never. Absolutely not. In 27 years, including myself, I've never seen anybody. I have people that are very high-end CEOs, people that are just shakers and movers, these people that are severe type A personalities, OCD, don't take no for an answer, you know, take no prisoners type deal. Even that, they can't do it perfect. These are habits that take time to change. Uh, these are, you know, the choices that you grew up with and are still living. They've been, you know, heavily ingrained into your psychology. So, they take time to change. They take time to, you know, replace. So the formula, if there is such thing as, you know, people that succeed, they never give up. They just keep going. They fall. They get right back up. They fall again. They get right back up and they keep going. And over time, things will change. Over time, your habits will become ingrained, those healthy habits, and you'll be way on your way to health. Um, obviously, some people do not have the luxury to wait long so yeah if something that you're dealing with is a severe case then obviously the more hard work ethic and diligence and discipline is going to be required but anyway this is the message for today polycystic ovarian syndrome and you guys reach out to me um, again i'm your host dr pnd with your health reclaimed and i cannot wait to see you next time have a great day bye-bye